All right. Thanks, Gideon. So, yeah, I'll just uh, remind everyone of the obvious that we have uh, very strong evidence that uh, we are in uh, space time, which is asymptotically the sitter in the future and was likely asymptotically the sitter in the past. Uh, so, we would like to have quantitative tools to understand um, this uh, space time. So, I tried to interpret the words DSCFT in a broader context. Just uh, can we compute cosmological observables in the sitter space times? Uh, maybe not full blown holography, which is typically a you know, strong weak type of duality, but just uh, maybe weakly coupled objects. Can we? apply new methods to compute them. We uh, touch base with other areas of um, holography, like, uh, like in flat space, this idea of trying to obtain scattering amplitudes from a non-shell perspective, or now the celestial amplitudes program, try to e exploit some of what we know from ADS-CFT to try to say something beyond perturbation theory in the sitter space. And also these conferences had a few talks exploring two interesting regions. One is the uh, late time boundary in uh, cosmological slicing, where we think that, uh, where we usually set up initial conditions for the universe from, uh, for lambda CDM cosmology, where we think is like essentially the reheating surface at the end of inflation. And another uh, region that uh, people talked about was this uh, inside the static patch. So the observer uh, that is free falling during the Seer era, the region that he or she has access to. So how do we understand the physics within this uh, box with the horizon? So these are the two perspectives. I think that the Panelists are probably tilted towards the cosmological horizon, but I, I just want to acknowledge that I think that these two um, perspectives are probably, it's important to keep in mind that there are these two different regions in which one can ask questions. And I imagine that ultimately both of them will play an important role if we are to understand the sitter space uh, completely. So I just, I don't want to talk much. I will just, hand over to the um, panelists and uh, I told them to keep it short so that we can open up and people can ask questions about their specific remarks or bring up uh, issues that weren't brought up. And um, I will put up by the end, you don't need to take notes by the end of all the presentations, I will put up just a slide with the points raised by every presenter plus a couple of things that I thought of. And then people can refer to this slide just to remind themselves of what's going to be discussed over the next 20 or 30 minutes. So without further ado, let's go alphabetically. So Paulo, uh, if you want to take over, share your screen, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So first of all, I would like um, to um, give uh, to have me. The, uh, I would like to thank you for having me among the panelists. And I don't want to really give uh, a, a talk. Uh, more, I would like to brought up some point for discussion that uh, I think might be relevant. And uh, I will do, uh, uh, if I give, uh, I have to give a title to uh, the um, couple of points I want to raise is uh, DS CFT with a uh, um, question mark. And uh, I, will, uh, I will explain now what that, that question mark means. So I guess that every, everyone agrees that one of the reasons for looking for a DSCFT type of description is uh, to ultimately have a microscopic theory for uh, the sitter or more generally for expanding universes and I have an, and handle on its quantum, uh, quantum phenomena. However, we have also to be honest uh, that we are kind of far from uh, uh, such an uh, ambitious program and uh, even uh, more uh, um, in, in a lower scale, <laughs> we uh, have even difficulties to have a full understanding of a simple quantum field theory in a fixed DS, uh, DS background. Even in that case, there are a lot of questions that, at least in my opinion, 
uh, are still unanswered and maybe are the basics if you want to go the afterward quantum in, uh, in the understanding of, uh, of the sitter. However, I want to be optimistic. I don't think that uh, the future is uh, as gray and uh, uh, as it might appear. And uh, to the word DSCFT, as also uh, uh, already anticipated, we can actually try to give uh, uh, a more broad meaning. For example, one way to approach this problem might start uh, lower level than uh, try to go fully to the uh, for looking for the microscopic theory. And uh, is what some um, so well, the first question is. Uh, can, can we take uh, holography in a looser way? What I mean with this is uh, I would like to take more uh, the point of view that Austin uh, had in his, uh, in his talk. And uh, in, rather than uh, you know, when you talk about the CFT, always we have in mind uh, uh, some RG flow, some very uh, complete way of understanding uh, the, the physics. But then uh, at the end of the day, we can keep in mind that uh, first, the uh, observables that I will put in, in quotation mark, which are typically the wave function of the universe or uh, the correction function, are naturally defined to some uh, to some uh, space type boundary. And uh, um, they have all the time evolution completely in integrated out. So we can ask generally the big question of uh, um, um, what are the rules that these observables have to obey in order uh, for them to come from a causal, a unitary time evolution? So a key point is how to understand causality and unitarity. So, but we have to have in mind again that we are computing something which is computed in a space like slice at fixed time and all the time evolution has been integrated out. So uh, I won't talk much about unitarity. Uh, I will leave this more to, to Rico. I will uh, just want to comment uh, something about the causality because I think that uh, it's uh, in the same time a little bit unnatural to, to think about causality because again, we are a fix, uh, we are computing something which is uh, equal time. So it's not clear what it, what it means uh, from that perspective. However, we don't have to forget that uh, uh, these objects has to have some imprint of uh, how locality is encoded. And in, in this sense, we already had the, some suggestion that uh, for uh, at least perturbatively, at least perturbatively, uh, the wave function uh, in the bunch Davis vacuum satisfy what are called the um, Stemmer relations. Now, Stemmer relations is just the, gen uh, the general statement that uh, uh, double discontinuity in a partially overlapping channel vanish, which means uh, substantially if I have to make some drawing, if you have uh, some uh, process, once you with uh, one, two, three external states, four, five, and six, then uh, and uh, I take uh, the discontinuity both in this channel and uh, in the other channel, like uh, two, three, four, five, six, one. The double discontinuity, if I take them simultaneously, uh, mm, uh, the, 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 the quantity has, uh, has, has to vanish in the, in the physical region. Now, we know that this is true uh, for uh, at least some, uh, some classes of, uh, of theories, of the function of classes of theories. And also we know that uh, the similar statement in uh, uh, flat space is implied so this, this relation are implied by causality, precisely by causality. 
So there is a first question of whether also this extend, so there is a, in this sense, this offer a concrete way to, to attack the problem. Nevertheless, it has the weak point that the analysis that has been done, it's a graph by graph analysis. So really heavily relies on perturbation theory, while in flat space, it is a non-perturbative statement. So, the, so the general question is maybe thinking more in this uh, in this uh, in the in this sense uh, might give us a handle even of some non-perturbative statement about how causality is encoded in uh, in uh, in, uh, in the wave function, and I think this is a very important a very important problem because it's the basics of our uh, understanding and it, it is going to constrain a lot both the the, the um, Functional structure of the way, of the way function of, our, of the correlation function, or any observables that we want to compute, and also uh, uh, constrain which type of processes may, may, may occur. So this is the first. So for me, one of the things that is open is big and it's attackable, it's solvable in the uh, short run is uh, addressing this type of of, uh, of, uh, of question. And I would like to hear also from other people in the in the audience whether they think that there are other compatible uh, uh, complementary ways to attack this, uh, this imp very important uh, question. This, 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 sorry, the, the, the second point I want to raise instead is actually what I consider a more profound type of, of question that are, uh, what are the correct observable we should compute? So now, uh, the reason for asking this question, I think, uh, um, well, I, I can, there are several reasons. Uh, I think um, I, I pinpoint, I'm going to pinpoint two of them. The first one is that we know that, uh, especially if you consider uh, the Poincare patch uh, in, in the sitter, we, a single observer doesn't have uh, fully access uh, to, um, uh, to future infinity where supposedly these objects live. So uh, no single observer can have uh, access to the full info at uh, future infinity. And or more generally, taking more uh, a generic cosmological point of view, I mean, this is related also to the, the to, not to cosmic variant. And the second one that actually is what I want to refer to is that, uh, the, um, I mean, uh, again, uh, we want to understand the sitter uh, to understand uh, or to understand uh, um, these expanding universes to have an handle uh, also on, on uh, what's happening in early times. At some point, the quantum gravity effects are gonna kick in. Kick in. And this mean, and we know that when gravity is, uh, uh, when gravity um, is important, uh, we cannot define any more uh, local observables. So, uh, at this point, I, I want to raise some, I don't know how much provocative, provocative uh, um, issues that in any case, anything that we, uh, we do when we do this calculation is considering local observables in a local uh, QFT type of language requiring <laughs> locality on interaction. Where where locality, for locality of interaction, I refer to the fact that typically we mm, consider um, interaction with the, uh, you know, if they have derivative, they have positive, they have it in space and time, they have uh, uh, positive powers of, of, uh, of, this, of these derivatives. Now, uh, that's great, that, that can work, that actually uh, we can uh, have uh, some uh, handle of uh, at least uh, um, some, some part of the physics of, 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 of interest. But for the longer run uh, uh, target of understanding also how quantum effects uh, kicks in, maybe I, I, I think that this language 
is uh, also it, it is it, it isn't uh, manifestly inadequate. What I mean with this is that uh, if uh, the final physics that we know that we cannot really define, we cannot when we uh, have quantum gravity effects into play, we cannot really define uh, quant uh, local observables. Shouldn't maybe even the in the part in the regime where this is a reasonable uh, approximation, shouldn't we try to define uh, um, either um, the same? So point one, either try to define uh, or more than define to describe the same observables we we used to compute but with a non manifestly local local language and and uh, and uh, we have some lesson to learn for scattering amplitude in this sense where also we uh, we at this perturbation period know how to abandon the the field theory, the field the language the field theory language and the second point is that maybe we should try to define non local observables from the start that may be reduced to local stuff uh, in the region where they should. And the reason for, to say this is also because the notion of locality, it's at least for me that come from the flux from uh, lambda equal zero, is tied also to the notion of uh, uh, cluster decomposition. Cluster decomposition is known to fail even for light states in the sitter. Because if you compute the, the correlation function, that's going to grow with log for large separations. Now, and this seems to be connected to the branch diffusion process that the wave function uh, goes into. This relation has been studied uh, in uh, some papers by uh, Dionysios, uh, Deneff, and, uh, and, other, uh, and, other, uh, and other people. And in order to have a hint of what was happening for them, it was necessary to define new observables, which are not the traditional one that uh, we are used to, which have some sort of non-locality built in. So maybe that, that's for me is one more reason to be done uh, with the idea that, uh, uh, together with what has already said, maybe we are not. Uh, if you want to have more hints of what's happened, uh, of um, go, uh, uh, to, to learn some deeper lecture. Uh, even in the region where uh, locality might work, where this uh, this locality is uh, is uh, is a good approximation, is a is a good way is a good way to, to talk about the physics. Maybe we should try to redefine that physics in in other terms. And with this, I conclude. All right, wonderful. Thanks a lot, Paulo. Uh, I encourage people if they have any questions that come up during the presentations to type them in the chat so that the moment that all the presentations are over, we can quickly go through those questions to get things moving. So, uh, okay, so now we move to Enrico. Please take it away, Enrico. Um, sorry, there was some question in the chat, I think. I don't know if you want to... Yeah, I, I typed it, but then after we're done, we, we start going through the questions in the chat. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Guy. So, okay, well, this panel discussion about uh, the sitter. So I think the kind of the goal is understanding quantum, quantum gravity in the sitter space. And I think maybe it's worth just saying it again. Some people say it uh, several times during the various review talks that, that I heard. And that I think the strong motivation where we want to do it in the sitter and we're just not happy to do it in anti the sitter is um, because we hope that this is relevant to describe something that has to do with our universe, huh? whether that's the, the primordial universe. Okay. So I, I wanted to stress that and perhaps go, go back to that motivation uh, um, and, and see in what sense that can uh, um, give us an orient, orient our efforts towards this problem. Um, 
I also wanted to discuss how, I mean, of course, there are many approaches. And one thing that I'm enjoying particularly of this uh, workshop is that it's bringing together um, the effort of many people from various directions, some of which I was more familiar to, some of which less. Uh, and as a general kind of feeling at the sociological level, I feel that the, the effort on the sitter space is much less coherent than it is on, on ADS, or at least that's, that's my perception. And I think it is useful to have an event where we're bringing together uh, various ways of thinking. I mean, hopefully something, something some new point of view will, will come out of that. Definitely there is, you know, you know the well-tested uh, perturbative theory approach and um, Austin has given a nice uh, review of, this, of these aspects, uh, uh, for example, uh, last to two days ago. Um, another approach is more related to, well, let's take the thing where we know it worked in ADS CFT and then see how much we can tweak that more or less majorly or minorly to make it work uh, in the CIPNA. And perhaps another approach that has been discussed a lot during this, this, this workshop has been uh, really uh, heavily relying on, on the powerful tool of representation theories and on the symmetry group of the sitter and try and say something on perturbative. So I, I think those are perhaps covers the, the various approaches that have been discussed. And I mean, of course, the, the thinking of quantum gravity and quantum field theory in the city space is a very long history. Uh, um, but I would say that there is a recently new interest in, in the past couple of years. So it, it's kind of an, a nice time to uh, reconvene and maybe try to give uh, some coherence to the efforts or maybe agree on what we think is uh, uh, a reasonable, interesting target for the near future, or maybe disagree and still learn something from it. And so I wanted to bring up three discussion points. Many of the keywords have already been mentioned by, by Paul and probably will later. So one is about unitarity, another is about locality and causality. And finally, the third one is a little bit more uh, uh, more provocative, hopefully it's not too provocative for the, the people at this uh, workshop, but it's going to be about thinking of which thing in the sitter, uh, which lessons that we can learn in the sitter, we can take away and use, apply to uh, the real world and, and which don't have this property. Uh, so let me start with unitarity very, very quickly. And so just in the spirit of this being a discussion, I'm not going to review any of the exciting recent uh, progress that we have made in this field, but I will try to um, um, to describe this more as a, as open questions and what I think would be interesting to discuss and do in the near future. So, really, unitarity. Wh why is it important? What well, what is it? First of all, it's I think it's an essential connection. This little train going fast from some mathematical bunch of notions like operators and Hilbert spaces that per se have no physical meaning to something that we think has to do with physics. So it has to do with predictions and predictions probability has to go between zero and one and at a very rough, rough level that that's what unitarity does. Uh, perhaps a little bit more in detail why we think unitarity is interesting. Well at some kind of very naive level it is really the requirement of unitarity that makes it too hard to UV complete gravity. If you don't care about unitarity, you can UV complete gravity, you just put you know, perturbative propagators that go like one over P to the 32, and eventually that's going to be UV complete, um, even just uh, naive power counting normalizable. But it's really when you ins insist on being unitary and renormalizable that you find that you have a hard time with gravity. So definitely we know that's going to be an important point of the puzzle when we think of UV completing gravity. Um, we know unitar unitarity is not just a an important property to fulfill, but is a strong crutch to rely upon. Uh, on the flat space, for example, it gives us properties such as the factorization of amplitudes, as well as unitarity methods that are not just ways in which we check unitarity, but we heavily use unitarity to compute things in a much easier, quicker, or more transparent way. So that's the second reason why I think it's important. And the last reason is that I think unitarity is a way to to bring down some constraining powers from the UV completion and apply it onto the uh, perturbative effective field theory regime, which is what we eventually will use to make predictions for any physical phenomenon. And I think unitarity, for example, in the spirit, in the spirit of positivity bounds that have been studied so much, is the tool that tells you that there is something that even if you don't know the UV completion, there is something positive, and you can bring that down to the effective field theories and continue to claim that that is positive. So I think that is the third way in which unitarity can help us. 
um, making progress. And so, what's, what, so this is kind of, I think is well motivated, understand inequality in, in the city. And I'm thinking at the broad sense, both in, the, in terms of the bulk, as well as in terms of the boundary. So there might be various formulation of what we mean by unitarity, and some of them might have more of a bulk flavor, some of them more of a holographic flavor. All of them, I think, are interesting. And I think there has been quite some work, at least in the last couple of years. I have seen several papers, and it seems that they're all going in the same directions, but they haven't managed to converge. So I thought I would mention this fact. So there is def definitely the effort that, that says, well, we have this really large, powerful, constraining symmetry group, which is the, the isometry groups of, of the sitter space. Um, and so we have a notion of what its unitary irreducible representation are. So you know, let's leverage that. And I think it, it makes absolute sense. It's beautiful because it's, it's non-perturbative. And this is something that, that we have heard uh, already quite a bit from, from Dion and Nicola uh, in the previous days, uh, various aspects of this. Another aspect of this is, is trying to say, well, at some deepest level, unitarity um, is just the fact that the states in the Hilbert space have positive norm. And that is what is kind of the workhorse of the numerical bootstrap in, in CFT, that plus some crossing symmetry and some resolution of the identity. Uh, and there have been a couple of work recently that also leveraged that aspect. This is also a point of view which is non-perturbative. Finally, I think there is a third point of view uh, that I've been you know, involved in, and I find very interesting, is that we have finally understood what are the consequences of unitarity to all orders in perturbation theory for very generic classes, for particles of, of any mass, any spin, in fact, on any FLRW space time, not just the sitter. And so there are recent results that go under the name of the cosmological optical theorem and cosmological cutting rules uh, that I think is very interesting. Um, what I don't think has happened in, in the community, and I think it would be very interesting both to discuss and, and comment, is how all of these notions uh, of unitarity are related to each other, if they are at all, and what is in some sense the Venn diagram of these notions of unitarity. And because of what I said above, I think this is very important. Um, clearly, the, these different approaches have different features. Some of them are fully non-perturbative, some of them are valid also when you deform the S a little bit, which might be a useful uh, feature to have uh, since eventually uh, our universe is not exactly the same. So it's interesting to have to know which notions of unitarity survive to small perturbations. And perhaps the, the flavor of this third approach is to look at uh, something which is in perturbation theory, so it's less nice than being non-perturbative, but it has this robustness to it. And it's in fact valid in all FRW space time as long as you have the same vacuum, the bunch Davis vacuum. Um, and I thought since uh, since we have already heard talk, uh, talks, uh, review talks about point one, but not as much discussion of point three, I thought I would just mention it in one line. Uh, this cosmological optical theorem says that if you write the wave function perturbatively, uh, its coefficient have to obey some simple relation, which is the sum of all the discontinuity of all possible cuts has to be zero. And this has been proven to, to all, of, all loop orders. So, okay, so I'll leave it there. The question, how are these notions of unitarity related? Uh, what, which one implies which one? Uh, are they completely different? Do they make different assumptions? Uh, I don't know the answer. So I, 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 maybe we will not get to an answer to that here, but it's interesting to, to discuss. The other is, is the aspects of locality and causality that uh, Paolo has already uh, mentioned. So I'll give you my, my take on, on this business. We would like to know how locality and causality is uh, encoded in the boundary. I think some progress has been done on the perturbative level. Uh, and I, I think it's interesting because it's, uh, it goes under the, a very simple um, uh, property that wave function coefficient in perturbation theory is have to satisfy that if you take derivative with respect to external energies, they have to vanish when the external energy is vanished. And this is most likely valid to all order in perturbation theory too, uh, and is only valid for massless particle, but it's quite general. For example, it's, it's expected to be valid for pure gravity uh, to all orders in any number of, uh, in any number of dimensions. So, it has some quite general character to it. It's not just a coincidence of something. Um, definitely, it's, it's a condition, uh, the, um, 
uh, a perturbative uh, notion of, uh, of, of, of locality and manifest locality. And I think this is important because eventually the most likely contact that we would make with observation, oh sorry, and this is important because, for example, we might like to understand gravity from a different point of view and uh, BCFW like recursion relation while in flat space gives us a different way of thinking about gravity, which is um, the only way to consistency glue together uh, three point functions for graviton in a way that respects uh, factorization theorems. And so we would like to do something similar in the sitter, at least gravity we know is the one force that is definitely going to be part of the game. And, and, and I wrote it in red because nothing like this has been, has been derived yet. And I think that would be an important near term goal. Um, the other thing that I keep mentioning is that another thing that we can do here is in the absence of a fully non perturbative formulation of quantum gravity, we can at least see what the constraints of a putative formulation in the UV would be for low energy observable. And so there is this notion of, cosmolo of cosmological positivity bounds. I don't think we can just take flat space positivity bounds and apply them to cosmological space time. I think we have already proof that that's incorrect, that there are theories that are consistent in, in flat space and not in the sitter and vice versa. So the set of theories has to be different. Uh, but exactly how uh, we can write down this positivity bounds, usually they rely on causality, but it's not clear what the role of causality is in any calculation so far that, that I know of. Perhaps this has to do with our, uh, our, our tendency to compute only equal time correlators in which the whole Lycon structure is completely gone because everything is defined on an equal time hypersurface, everything commutes. Uh, so perhaps we have to be a little bit more creative in what we compute or, or maybe people have different takes on, on this problem. And finally, yeah, more generally is the idea is, what do we think is the holographic meaning of locality in the bulk? In ADS, there is this notion of having a large gap in the conformal dimensions of the operators on the boundary. Is it just the same thing here? Is this some well-defined notion of cluster decomposition? And I'll, I'll leave that pretty vague. Finally, the last thing before concluding, which is perhaps more controversial. I hope it's not too controversial. I don't mean it as a, as a criticism to, to, to anyone's work, but uh, as, as, as a way to try to keep in mind the compass towards what is the most likely direction in which we, we can make progress. So quantum gravity in the sitter is really a hard problem. And I think this is something that, that Dion emphasized. And the harder it is, the more you can allow yourself to make some simplifying assumptions because it's already hard enough. We might as well try and, and, and get it started. And, and clearly, I think it's, it's a great idea to put as much symmetry as you can, which means full the sitter isometry. And when you can, lo, uh, work in low dimensions if, if the problem becomes more treatable. Uh, what, what I was curious to have is your take on anyone's on what results or general lessons that we can learn in the sitter can carry over to the real world. And let me mention exactly what I mean by the real world is that we, we, we always say that in the future and in the past, our universe is, looks like the sitter space, but I think it carries some, some critical differences. And so I wanted to make a list of things that carry over and things that do not carry over from the sitter, from the spherical cow approximation of our universe to our actual universe. And I've tried to write down a few, but you know. so I think in general, learning about holography with a space-like boundary as opposed to a time-like, maybe that can have some general lessons. How do we really organize this, uh, uh, this Euclidean field theory that lives on the boundary? Maybe there's something general that probably carries, carries over. Um, other aspects about UV, UV completion of pure gravity, if they have to do with the ultraviolet, Hopefully they don't care too much about modifying a little bit the boundary condition of the seat. There are other things that I think do change and it's important to keep in mind without being overly critical. One is that every maximally symmetric space time does not have a history, does not have a cosmology. Just when you say the word maximally symmetric, it means every point is equal to every other point. So there cannot be a history, okay? It's, it's always the same thing. So definitely it's not our universe. Uh, more, more precisely, more to the point, even the very thing that we measure in cosmology, which are zeta, zeta curvature perturbation, gauge invariant version of curvature perturbation, they actually do not exist in the system um, because they have to do with the foliation of space time. Uh, I think that's important when we try to think of what we would like to compute. Uh, 
other aspects of, for example, unitarity that comes from unitary irreps, uh, some of them might carry over to something which is closer to the universe, but some might not. So I, I thought I would mention one. Uh, if, if you look at the unitary irreps of, of, of the sitter, you cannot have arbitrary negative mass uh, scalars. So that is just the, the discrete series uh, that has some negative masses, but definitely not every negative mass is goes. They do not admit unitary representation. And just to mention is that half of the models of inflation, the inflaton has a negative mass. Uh, in principle, we, would like, we think that that's still fine because it's not exactly the sitter, it's some FLRW deformation thereof. But it's good when, when we find results to understand how they will generalize to, to more realistic uh, description of our universe. So I'll stop there and I look forward to hearing what, 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 what people's opinion is on, on these issues. All right, thanks a lot, Enrico. So again, uh, I encourage people to type questions. I actually, I'm just finishing type my second one. And then we move on to Costas. Take it away, Costas. I think you are muted. Uh, you mute. You muted. Cost sorry. Okay, let me start with the thanks again. <laughs> so I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for the opportunity to be in this panel discussion and also for organizing this uh, very nice uh, workshop. So I think my discussion will start pretty much from the point where Enrico stopped. So so instead of uh, discussing uh, the sitter. I will actually start by discussing cosmology. And um, so we'll organize this discussion in five different parts. Um, so uh, Nick already mentioned that uh, you know, this may be a controversial topic. I, I don't believe it should be a controversial topic. And I'll start by first presenting some qualitative evidence why one should believe about holography for cosmology. Then I will move on to discuss quantitative evidence. Then I will go on to address the question, why holography? That also addresses in part uh, some of the stuff that Paolo mentioned earlier. Is it enough to just look at the symmetries and the constraints and the server, or we want a more full-fledged holography? And then I will uh, go on to discuss uh, open issues, and there are so many open issues. Um, and then uh, briefly discuss uh, prospects. Okay, so let's start first with qualitative features. Should we believe there should be some holographic description by just looking at uh, our own universe? And I would say yes, and some of the stuff already been mentioned. So we know that our universe is currently dominated by dark energy. And we believe that in the past, uh, we have a period of inflation for the space time in both cases near the sitter. And in between we have a time evolution, which we also believe it's monotonic, there is an arrow of time. So now if you look now on the right hand side, this looks very similar to the generic structure of quantum field theories, where you have uh, quantum field theories take you from a UV fixed point to an IR fixed point, where the theory is in both sides as CFTs, and that's precisely where you have, in a sense, the connection of the, the set and the set as CFT. But I would argue that more generally, there is a correspondence, not just at the fixed points, but all along the flaw. So in this picture, time evolution is inverse G flaw, and that already buys you something quite big. So it explains the hour of time. So the monotonicity of renormalization group flaw explains why we see a monotonic, uh, uh, an hour of time. Also explains issues like uh, you know the, the entropy of the universe, why the universe started in a low entropic state, and so on. And a longer talk, I would have discussed this, but it also gives a very natural explanation about uh, the resolutions of hot big bang puzzles that started the theory of inflation, like the horizon problem, the flatness problem, and so on. All of this translates to very natural properties 
of renormalization group flow. So in a sense, if one believes, if one takes holography for granted, that already explains both that energy and also the, the inflation of the picture in the past. Okay, these are qualitative features that we already know they're out there and we see that uh, they fit very naturally within this framework. Now let me move on to more quantitative uh, arguments. So first of all, this framework correctly reproduces completely general inflationary predictions for all spectra and bispectra for general inflationary models, not just the sitter or near the sitter. Any single scalar with arbitrary potential it could also be a power law. All of this are exactly reproduced using this, this framework. And I, I believe there is more recent work that was discussed in this conference about higher point functions in the sitter also can be viewed as uh, quantitative evidence for an existence of holographic duality. And moreover, this new framework allows for new holographic models, which are now based not on gravity coupled into some other fields, but is based on uh, perturbative quantum field theory. And these models fit the CMB data remarkably well. So let me. Uh, flash this slide here. So this is um, what called the well-known plot about the CMB spectrum. The, uh, the red curve is the prediction of holographic cosmology and the blue curve is the prediction of uh, lambda CDM. And you can see that both fit the data equally well here in the bottom. There is this plot of residuals. This green band is the arrow bar from, uh, from, uh, from Planck. And this this blue uh, this this uh, black curve is the difference between lambda CDM and holographic cosmology. And if you look at uh, how well they fit the data, that they're both equally they fit the data equally well. So it's about uh, it's about one sigma difference. Okay, so um, so there are reasons to believe not just qualitatively but also quantitatively. I mean, this is really in a sense, infinite number of predictions that they are already verified. Okay, so why now do we need holograph? Is it enough to say there are some constraints at some point and we use some non perturbative let's say, bootstrap constraints or unitarity to, uh, to make predictions? That, that may as well give you all the right answers for the, uh, for the observables that we see in CMB because there are very few observables, basically the power spectrum and maybe leading non gaussianities But I think at the end of it, as a theoretical physicist, it's not just enough. So we want to understand, the reason we're doing this is because we want to understand what happens when quantum gravity effects become very important. In particular, we want to understand how the initial singularity is resolved. And in this framework, this is mapped to something very concrete. This is mapped to the infrared finiteness of the dual quantum field theory. So this dual quantum field theory is good to naively have, and actually generically naively have infrared divergences. But then when you look at them more closely, and actually, we you know I spent a number of years working with lattice gauge theories. We just published one, one paper recently, and we tried to see whether this naive infrared divergences are resolved by non-perturbatively. And this is indeed is the case. So non-perturbatively, so that the theory has incited the seeds of uh, the uh, resolution of the initial singularity. And this could potentially be observable at the, the, the very low L's on the spectrum, depending on how, the, how big is the effect relative to the, to the cosmic variance. So, so that's another reason for looking at, at, at holography. But more generally, holography is a much bigger framework, already covers all existing models, but allows for new models. So even, even if you may be just interested in phenomenology, you, you don't care about uh, how the initial singularity is resolved. You just care that uh, your model correctly reproduces CMB data or other astronomical data. Still, this, this model allows for more general phenomenology because it has models which cannot be described by just a gravity coupled to, uh, to inflaton. Okay, so that's the good things. Now the open issues. 
Okay, one of the open issues has already been discussed uh, quite a bit in this conference. There are many difficulties in finding the sitter in string theory. And uh, <clears throat> that's why it has been very difficult to establish precisely the holographic rules. Uh, in my mind, uh, it's not clear this is an issue for the sitter, could be an issue from the current formulation of string theory rather than an issue for, uh, for the sitter. For instance, if we look back 100 years ago, when we had quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics would not explain spontaneous emission from, uh, from atoms. This did not mean quantum mechanics was wrong. This, this meant you need a better formulation. And quantum field theory came, which is quantum mechanical, and resolved that problem. So similarly here, when we have the holographic duality, one could take the perspective and says the dual quantum field theory is the right language, and there may be a reformulation, which is not a first quantized theory, uh, a reformulation of string theory in the bulk that uh, would allow us to find properly uh, the city vacuum. These are not sitting in uh, perturbative vacuum that we can see with, with perturbative string theory. Now, the second issue may be related actually to, to the first. So if one tries to, to formulate the duality, that uh, always involves an analytic continuation. And one of the big mis mysteries is what is really the nature of this analytic continuation. And I'm going to describe it in two different ways here. I think in uh, most of the, uh, of the previous talks, it was mostly the first one, which uh, is, 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 is probably more recognizable, although I, I believe the previous talks stayed mostly on the bulk rather than on the boundary. So there are two different equivalent ways to describe the, uh, the duality. One is you start by with a standard quantum field theory uh, on a space that has an arbitrary scale, and you do the computation carrying this, this scale with you. For instance, uh, you know, if you had ADS5, this would be n equals four from being angles and would be on flat space with a scale. And now suppose you want to describe the set of physics. Now, after you compute the observables, which are correlation functions, of the energy momentum tensor, then at the end of the computation, you send elsewhere going to minus one. And that's the answers which enter in the, the holographic formulas for the cosmological observables. And uh, so that's one way to view this. And there is an alternative way, which is the one that I mostly used in my previous papers. Then you start with standard quantum field theory on standard flat space. Then you do the computation there. And then after you do, when you do the computation, then you analytically continue the momenta to minus the magnitudes of the momenta. So momenta squared to minus, so in a sense, uh, you, you take the magnitude of the momenta and you analytically continue to the imaginary axis. And uh, similarly, you, uh, so for instance, if it is an SUN theory, then it would take the uh, N squared to minus N squared. It would be an SON theory, it would take N to minus N. And then uh, th these are the rules you need to use in order to, to, to put in, inside the holographic formulas in order to produce the results I described in the previous slides. Um, and it would be great if one understands better why these are the right rules. This, this, these rules, in a sense, came out of trying to set up the, 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 the duality in a bottom-up way rather than in a top-down way. We didn't have a top-down because we don't understand how to get the system string theory. Okay, so now um, let me finish with a brief discussion of uh, future prospects. But first of all, I think uh, some of that has already been discussed both by Paolo and by Enrico. I think there is a lot of recent, very interesting results, including the ones reviewed by Enrico about the Bach unitarity, also the relation of flat space containing amplitudes. And I think all of these are now kind of ready to, to to bear fruit. It's, uh, there are lots of interesting results and it would be great to connect all different results as, as Enrico will say. And I would like to add a second uh, kind of avenue to this kind of a bit more formal uh, developments, a bit more phenomenolo phenomenological development. I think it is now clear that these models fit actual data equally well as conventional models. So I think it is time to move to a more detailed phenomenology of these models, try to understand a bit better, not just the very early universe, but the entire uh, history of our universe, try to model the heating period, 
other cosmic periods, try to understand what, for instance, dark matter would mean in these models, develop models that already incorporate uh, the, the standard model and, and, and so on. So move to really realistic, full-fledged phenomenology. Okay, thank you. All right, wonderful. Uh, thanks a lot to all the panelists. Um, not people didn't really use the chat very much other than me, so I don't want to hijack the beginning of the discussion by having people answer all my questions. So I, I will open. Um, please, if you want to ask a question, uh, just raise your hand and I'll call you by name. Then you can you can ask a particular member of the panel or I have a slide, uh, as I said, I will share this and I will not go full screen because otherwise uh, my zoom just becomes uh, hard to operate. So. so does anyone have a question? Maybe even the panelists, if they want, they can ask themselves, but let's uh, maybe at first open to the general audience. Uh, maybe I'll ask a question uh, to Enrico. So the Zeta issue connecting to the real world, uh, this is an issue in the for the past phase, but for the future phase, if lambda is a constant, is 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 it still an issue there, or you were referring to inflation? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. I think it's an issue for, for both, and I, I can be more specific, but since your question is about dark energy, let me say in what sense is an issue, in the sense that everything that you, uh, everything that we as uh, cosmologists living in this dark energy dominated universe, everything that we could ever measure, it's something that is set to zero in the Sitter limit. So all the perturbations that we can talk about uh, on our uh, dark energy dominated universe and how they evolve, you have to take all of that to zero to reach the, the CETA limit. So in, in that sense, it is true that the CETA is the limit. And if you wait long enough, everything will shift away and is all empty. But that's also the limit in which there is no cosmological observable to talk about. Uh, and so, it, I would argue that that is also a problem in this sense, that if you want to say something about you know, dark energy, if it has perturbations, uh, uh, what is the future of, uh, of our universe by evolving the initial condition in the future, and you want to make prediction for that, you need essentially to take into account the, the deviation from the sitter, in particular, that there is some dark matter around. Because how much dark matter has shifted away, so precisely how we reach um, the sitta that completely changes the observable. Let me say it a little bit more precisely. The, the, the perturbations that we know, they're not just sensitive to H, but they're sensitive to derivative of Hubble. In particular, they are sensitive to its first derivative and its second derivative. Of course, all of those are zero in the sitta. So all of the sensitivity to H dot and H double dot comes through things that are not lambda, through everything else. And I would say, by making the decision approximation, we can never say anything about that. Okay. Can I make a comment um, on, on the same? Um, I think as you go to, uh, let's say, the future decider, I mean, it is true that zeta variable is not well defined, but there is a different gauge invariant variable which is well defined because eventually you get the sitter plus a decoupled scalar field. And then the zeta just becomes the, flux the, uh, flux the, the, the fluctuations of the scalar field on a fixed dissipate ground. So it doesn't disappear, it just becomes decoupled from the uh, evolution, the, the cosmological evolution. So I actually don't think that, I mean, strictly speaking, maybe <laughs> this is going to be crazy, but to, to some extent, the future of our current lambda CDM is not the system. So let's just compute in the current universe the epsilon parameter h dot over h that is clearly decreasing like crazy. Let's say that dark energy is a cosmological constant. And let's just use lambda CDM values with lambda being 0 0.7 to compute 
h dot over h squared. Okay, that goes to zero very quickly in the future. Uh, and now let's compute the derivative of that h double dot over h squared, what is usually called eta parameter in inflation, but it doesn't matter. We compute it today. The limit of that is minus six in our universe, while it would clearly be zero in this. So that is a quantity which has to do with the background and its future limit is not the value that it takes in the sitter, it's some other value, which is minus six. Now, anything that knows about H double dot, for example, zeta perturbations, will behave differently in our universe than it does in the signal. I didn't understand. What, what's the, if you have the lambda CDM with a constant, cosmological constant, and you evolve it to the far future, and you're yeah. capable of making measurements within the observable universe, you would you say that there's a way to observe in the far future deviation for pure from pure this this is like a violation of the cosmic no hair theorem yeah so what happens is that for all the time in which a homogeneous and isotropic approximation holds i think you will see something that looks different from the city at some point all of the other galaxies are outside of your hubble radius and you're left with the only galaxy and probably homogeneity and isotropy becomes a very bad approximation and then from there you, you merge into approaching the theorem that you're stating. But from now until then, as, as long as homogeneity and isotopy is broken, I would say there is no time at which, for example, eta, h double dot, takes the value that it does in the sigma. In fact, it, it takes a constant minus six. So it, I'm not saying that it's clearly, eventually the sigma is gonna be approached, uh, but as far as we can define cosmology as a, as perturbation around homogeneous and isotropic, that never happens. You have to break homogeneity and isotropy before you approach this. But Enrico, does it make sense to talk about uh, slow row parameters when the first of them is going to zero? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, uh, all, all the other ones remain small because now you have one slow row parameter that's quite large. Right? So yeah. all, the, all the other higher derivatives that remain a small, much smaller than minus six or? The reason why I emphasize the second to the row parameter is because if you write down the equation for the simplest perturbations that there is in our universe, which is curvature perturbation, the equation, the linearized equation of motion has epsilon and eta into it. So clearly that quantity knows if eta is minus six or is zero, it will behave differently. And so if there is like a 37th derivative of some parameter that no one cares about, I don't care if it is constant or going to zero or not. Well, but then you can question uh, uh, applicability of perturbation theory, you know? If, uh, Eureka, is, uh, Eureka, you shouldn't be using zeta if you want to go into the uh, to the decitter limit. You should be using, uh, there is a, another linear combination, which is non-singular as, uh, as, as, as the uh, h goes to, h, h becomes a constant. I mean, zeta has one of phi dot inside it. So it's not, uh, the, the limit is not regular. But there is another linear combination where uh, in, in the limit, you just, the, the zeta just becomes uh, the perturbation of the scalar in a fixed the zeta background. That, that's, the, the, that's the equation you need to use. The other one is, is, is not valid in the limit you're interested in. I'm, I'm trying to make a case that anything that will happen in the conceivable future in which the universe is described by homogeneity and isotropy cannot be described in the zeta. Um, it, it, it has to do with how you approach the sitter rather than the sitter, which is, it doesn't mean, I mean, I'm not saying anything crazy. I'm saying that the question that you actually want to ask at the more observational level has to do with how you reach the limit rather than with the limit itself. Yeah, no, that, that I completely agree. Actually, I 100% agree with that. Yeah. And it, it doesn't, shouldn't stop us from doing quantum gravity in the sitter. It's still a good thing, but I mean, Dion asked the question of whether my comment applies to dark energy. I think it does to this extent. So, so you think, uh, uh, yes, yeah, I'm hijacking my privileges, but uh, so you think that oh, we, we know that slow row inflation uh, can be approached, right, by, by deforming the sitter a bit, but you think the dark energy is worse because it seems that there's no small deformation of the sitter that should take you to dark energy. Yeah, I think it's worse because what's left in the universe is just matter, which redshift. Uh, uh, precisely in, in such a way that epsilon decays, but eta doesn't, which is, 
I mean, it, it would be better if, if the cosmological constant depended on time. When you take a derivative, you're sensitive to that. But because lambda is exactly constant, anything else that changes, no matter how small, is what the derivative will hit. And so the approach to h equal constant will always be dominated by anything else because the contribution from a cosmological constant is zero. So anything else is bigger than zero. And I'm pointing that out as perhaps an annoying fact about lambda being constant that its derivative is zero. And so anything else like me will have a larger contribution to h dot than the cosmological constant in the whole universe. Very good. All right, thanks a lot. Um, let's uh, switch gears and uh, I'll bring up a, a question that was asked in the chat, not by me, by Alex Belling. Uh, which is related to a point that Enrico raised about uh, uh, locality from the point of view of the CFT. Maybe Costas can say something about it. Um, it's related to these uh, criteria that we expect, uh, AD, like some uh, duo of quasi-local ADS physics to satisfy this delta gap. And um, yeah, so I don't know. I'll, I'll just read. Uh, What's the DS principle for the suppression of higher derivative corrections to the effective action? In ADS flat space, it's delta gap. What's the DS equivalent? I don't know if people have anything to say about that. Well, maybe I can make a comment. I think for me, perturbatively, if you want to address the issue perturbatively, it would be the same as in ADS because there is a correspondence. Uh, so I would first start with the, uh, with the ADS story, then uh, go to the, to the limit where uh, I have locality, and then do the analytic continuations. Now, if, you are, if you're asking me whether the, the, the two commute, can I first do the analytic continuation and then go to the locality, that, that I don't know. But, but I'm confused because uh, heavy states will, the deltas don't lie on the, on the real axis, right? You go off into the complex plane. So, yes. yeah, I think so that's one of the reason that they do not obviously commute the, the, the two limits. But so then you think of the question comment? of. Uh, can I make a comment about this? Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, if it's a weakly coupled theory and you have a spectrum of masses, uh, you can register this uh, masses in the imaginary part of delta fairly transparently. And there will be a gap in the imaginary part of that. This is assuming it's a weakly coupled theory. So, so is it clear that the notion of delta gap can make sense in the sitter space? I, I'm uh, just saying that? that if you have a theory that's approximately free particles with small interactions, which is where this intuition of the gap comes from. Uh, and you just compute, it doesn't matter if you do, you can do a bulk calculation and extract the CFT quantities or whatever, the conformal scaling weights. You will uh, find a spectrum of scaling weights which uh, lie on the principal series, but at discrete points on the imaginary axis. Uh, and they will be gap. If you have, it's in the sitter units, you may have a few particles order one and then order 100,000. I think it's the same. It's this gapped intuition comes from weakly coupled fields in the bulk, and that you. I think Costas was roughly saying something like this. Yeah. I, I see. Mean, I, I agree completely with Dio's comment. Yeah. So, so it's delta gap, uh, but uh, you, the, you measure the size of the gap in, in the imaginary axis. Uh, since the conversation is going in the direction of connecting the, the sitter to to ADS, I wanted to. Well, to us, maybe Costas or maybe also other people, uh, something I, I mentioned in the chat is the extent to which um, we expect to do a, um, an analytic continuation of uh, ADS or Euclidean ADS to the sitter. And so there is one thing that, that confuses me, and it is the following. In ADS, we think that um, the CFT living at the boundary should uh, respect uh, reflection positivity, this uh, Osterwalder Schroeder's axiom. I mean, in Euclidean, at the boundary of Euclidean ADS, it does reflection positivity. In ADS, it's just uh, Lorentzian unitarity. 
So when you take that and bring it to the sitter, it would naively suggest that the CFT at the boundary of the sitter would also satisfy some rescaled version of this reflection positivity, maybe changes by some minus sign sprinkled around. However, it seems to me that intuitively from all the discussions that we have had about the different nature of unitary irreducible representation in the sitter, one should not expect uh, the boundary of the sitter to have such a property. So why isn't this a contradiction? Well, okay, if, if, if you, in a sense, if, if, if you give me uh, a sharp uh, question, I, I, can, I can check it, but uh, I have not seen any, any contradiction so far. It's, it's not gonna look, uh, because of the new signs, it's not gonna look uh, like uh, conventional positivity properties. But I mean, so far, in a sense, the analytic continuations, when you start from a normal standard quantum field theory that satisfies all normal conditions, and then you go through the holographic dictionary, and then you obtain the cosmological observables after you do the analytic continuations I mentioned, the bulk quantities have standard reality conditions and positivity properties you expect them to have. So I haven't seen any counterexample even though I, I, I do not understand why that happens, but that's something that it does happen. Is this valid for us? Has, has this been checked for at least four point function or higher? Well, four point functions, uh, okay, we are doing right now, so I cannot give you it, 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 it seems the answer is yes, but okay, we haven't finished. Up to three point functions, we've checked it completely generally. So the, the three-point function has no notion of reflection positivity because you need an even number of points so that half of them are the reflection of the other half. So really the only non-trivial check would be at the level of the two-point function. Yes. But there I think you can always make something reflection positive by rescaling. So the really the litmus test of knowing no, 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 the, 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 the holographic formula doesn't allow you any, it is what it is. And it passes again infinite number of, of checks for, for any potential, it gives you exactly the right answer with the right positive uh, coefficient. So I'm not, uh, I'm not forcing this by, by hand rescaling. So I'm just taking the normalizations that come from the, you know, the, the action, and then I just put them through the holographic formulas which were derived independently, and then you get exactly the right, uh, the right positivity properties. Yeah. Uh, so goes the same. I, I, I think the question that maybe if I rephrase what Enrico is saying is maybe the, the point is that this, if you, you, so your starting point is something that obeys all these properties, and maybe that's too restrictive if you want the general features of the sitter space. Uh, so, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. Yeah, so maybe if you allow yourself to violate reflection positivity from the starting point, that doesn't lead to anything terribly bad in the sitter, I think, at the end of the day. No, that, that I completely agree. Yes, absolutely. It just, I, I guess the, my only comment was we haven't seen the need for unconventional theory. This doesn't mean that uh, it could turn out that uh, the right theory does have unconventional properties and only the observables we looked at they just do not grow up that this properties. Yeah, I, I think it's not surprising that just two point functions, you would not see that and three point function you cannot because there is three point and if they cannot reflect. So I would say really things will get interesting and, uh, and non-trivial at the four point function level. And I'm not saying that reflection positive things necessarily are inconsistent in the system, but I would expect the sitter to have much more general stuff and not to have to be bound by these constraints since there is no requirement to have a, a big rotation to any Lorentz uh, uh, unitarity on the boundary. So it is somewhat, to me, it would be surprising if this reflection positivity came out on the boundary of the sitter. There wouldn't be any reason for me to expect that, that to be the case. And I would imagine that when you go to some four-point function and you start including some interesting representations, uh, especially probably those in the principal series uh, that have this imaginary part, maybe you will see that if you rotate that to Euclidean ADS, it will not be reflection positive. That would be my general expectation. Okay, well, 
Yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say that the principal series violates another uh, another property that you expect of Euclidean quantum field theory, which is that the spectrum is bounded, like one-sided and bounded. So, I mean, already there, it's in violation of the usual starting point of uh, Euclidean quantum field theory. But it's important, just to make a comment, it's important to distinguish uh, and there's another feature in ads cft which is the state operator correspondence that uh, we might not want to assume in the context of uh, the sitter and so it could be that we have operators transforming under whatever representation uh, what's important is that the states transform unitarily and uh, in ads cft there's a state operator corresponding relating the two but in the sitter it's a little more loose and so we should keep that in mind and also just a very simple comment about the three-point function it's not quite true that it's completely unconstrained it has some reality properties that it has to obey because if you have a bulk theory with a cubic self-interacting scalar and the coupling is imaginary uh, you would conclude that uh, with a standard kinetic term you, you would conclude that this theory is a non-unitary in the sitter so there are reality conditions and i think uh, you know even even in the simple setup now i think from Gosa's perspective there's an interesting uh, question which is that if you have a, a, a proposed seed dual cft that has multiple couplings you may have to add additional uh, rules to n square goes to minus n squared and q square goes to n square for each of all of these couplings in the theory and perhaps the interesting question is whether they, in the complexified plane of all couplings, there exist points where you can identify some unitary or positivity conditions that are compatible with the sitter. I don't know if this is something worth commenting. Well, I mean, I have looked at a multi-scalar case where I would have more uh, couplings. In that case, it was again the same, uh, the same continuation. It didn't require anything. You, you just keep the couplings uh, real before and after. Yes. Uh, okay. I mean, I can only say this is the, the stack we checked. Okay. You know, if we don't have a proof that uh, this would never happen for all couplings or possibilities. So, I mean, that's that's definitely a possibility. Yeah. So, so that so has realized, and since no case is, is never realized. Just to give an example in this somewhat more exotic models that are related to this uh, higher spin Vasiliev theories, there were some models that had both N and also a Toff coupling. And it, I forget now, it could be that in that case, the Toff coupling uh, picks up a sign or whatever when you compare it to the ADS theory. Yeah, so in our case, the tough coupling is only stays real and doesn't change. It's it's only the uh, the momenta and the um, and the rank of the gauge group that, that change. But so, so, so again, uh, going back to this three point function, I, I agree that in, in like Lorentzian unitary CFTs, you would expect the, the OP coefficients to be real. But at the level of this uh, osterwalder schroeder's axiom on the Euclidean version of the theory, there is no axiom corresponding to the three-point function being real. Maybe it is repackaged into something else. Do you know where is it? And well, it, if you have a bulk weakly coupled unitary theory, it has to be repackaged into the hermeticity of the bulk Hamiltonian, I guess. Yeah, that, yeah, I'm all for that. That's a very simple statement, though. In general, uh, you have to find the ana some sort of spectral decomposition of a two-point function and make sure the spectral density is positive. There's some discussion of this in these recent papers of Penedone, Sedal, and uh, Gorbenko and Komatsu. Let me ask a question. We were talking about positivity, but I want to ask a question about the zero. So Paolo mentioned about this as time and relations and he made a comment that I thought was interesting that they are known uh, non perturbatively in flat space, but only perturbatively in the sitter. Can you say a couple more words about that? Or... Uh, that uh, depends on the, how they have been proven. For example, in the case of um, flat space, it's a proof uh, which starts from the normal notion of, uh, of causality of, on, on commutators and it's uh, on uh, 
the correlation function. And so later on, as has been uh, related to discontinuities uh, in uh, scattering amplitudes. In this case, uh, we just checked whether uh, it was true diagram by diagram, uh, also for, for the wave function, and uh, it was indeed true. In the sense, we cannot just, given that we um, checked it, uh, we proven it uh, in a perturbation theory, we cannot extend it automatically to, uh, to the general statement as we have it in, uh, in, uh, in flat space. This doesn't mean that uh, might not be the case, but there is no such a proof so far. But do you think there's some technical barrier or uh, is just uh, hard work and it's doable or? Well, the truth is that uh, nobody tried try to do it. So I, I don't know how complicated it uh, can be. Let me see. Yeah, but I mean, there, there are so, uh, some to toy situation that one can, uh, can, uh, can uh, um, can use and then uh, um, and uh, from then uh, that it will be easier to stand up to a more general segment. So I don't. I think that is doable to 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 uh, to try a proof. Another thing is that there are unexpected uh, uh, situations that happen. Is the current status that these relations in the CIP are proven to all loops or only at three level? No, no, no. It's uh, okay. Let, let me do the, the, uh, this statement. It's. Uh, Proven at uh, all loops for uh, uh, for the integrants because uh, um, the, um, and uh, you need uh, to do some uh, so you, you have uh, some, some the integrand of your loop uh, of, of your loop relation which satisfy this uh, the, 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 these properties. Nevertheless, given that it's not clear what is uh, the uh, analytic structure at arbitrary loop, or what is uh, the, the um, space of functions to expect in general. It's difficult to make uh, a statement as, as so far about what's happening when you do the loop integrations. The, the loop and the time integration. This is the integral of both time and loops. Yeah, yeah, no. The, the time one is done. The one that you need to. The, we, we, uh, so what, what I'm saying that after you do the time integration, the transcendental function that you get to satisfy these relations. Okay. What is not clear? Well, I mean, uh, what is more uh, difficult to check? Given that we have a few few data about the type of sp space of function that you may expect, is what uh, um, what happens when you do the loop integration if they, they go through or not. But uh, I suspect that it, 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 uh, at least uh, um, well, yeah. I mean, I suspect that it should go through, but I mean, we, we, one needs a proof. Yeah, there will be probably all kind of divergences. Huh? IR divergences to be dealt with. Yeah, but I don't think that's uh, the, 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 that's a problem. Even when you do um, scattering amplitudes, so you have a, a, and you have massless states, you have to deal with IR divergence. I don't think the, the problem is going to be there. Very good. Let's uh, switch gears a, a bit. I'll bring uh, so Santiago Agui. Um, brought up a question in the chat about uh, the Sitter solutions in string theory. I don't know if you want to, if you're, I think you're still here, if you want to unmute and uh, say something. Yeah, so the idea is we can use uh, super string theory, for example, type 2 because we can use uh, super symmetry because then we have a negative cosmological constant. And I was wondering if the main problem is to use a string theory in the sitter is that as we have a positive cosmological constant, we cannot use supersymmetry at all. Maybe I can make a comment. Yeah, I don't think supersymmetry is the problem. If you have, <clears throat> let's say, n equals one theories in four dimensions which admit uh, the sitter solutions. So, supersymmetric theory can, can have non supersymmetric solutions. So it's not just the symmetry. I think string theory is uh, it, it's it's more complicated. I mean, the knockout theorems come from the more from the detailed structure of the theory rather than just uh, the symmetry. I mean, there are also yes go examples of the sitter vacua, but indeed, since they are all uh, break supersymmetry, they have to rely on a delicate uh, and detailed analysis of perturbative corrections. Uh, and some people 
doubt or not doubt whether that has been covered uh, uh, in detail. So I, I think that what makes it easier for ABS is that you know that a large number of corrections are completely absent, so the full non-perturbative level, for example, I don't know, super potential is maybe one loop uh, exact, but uh, when you break the full uh, uh, supersymmetry, yeah, you have to convince yourself that you have accounted for all possible perturbative corrections, some of which might not be known. And yeah, I, I would like to add that. Actually, I want to I wanted to uh, tie uh, what we discussed before to to the current topic. Do you do you all do you think that um, there will be some small violation of unitarity if we could define some non perturbative observable and compute it in the sitter because these constructions of the sitter vacuum and string theory they're typically meta stable. So do you think that if we understand a non perturbation theory with gravity switched on well enough that we'll be able to see that there is some exponentially small probability that we can't capture by just studying the sitter solution. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I mean, I don't have any specific thoughts about that, but I mean, for me, the instability in the sitter it's probably linked to the fact that uh, <clears throat> the massive states in the sitter are mapped to tachyonic states, masses below the BF bound. I mean, yes, I, I think it's um, this, this are probably not unrelated. Um. I can give another example from string theory. So the 26 dimensional uh, flat vacuum of bosonic string theory is. Um, is unstable, not just metastable. <laughs> it's uh, violently unstable, and it admits a nice formula, which is the Veneziano amplitude, which is uh, obeys very nice properties. And so, perhaps the question here, regardless of the metastability, is to try to look for uh, similarly nice and powerful formulas uh, in the Lissiter case. Okay, but if I follow your example, then you'd think that if we found, I know, some Veneziano uh, observe like observable. Where is the instability? In... Yeah, where is the instability? There's a tachyon if you decompose it, but the reality properties and it's a very powerful and constrained formula, right? It's uh... no, I agree with that. But then, but then you think that uh, if we found such a formula, you would have inside of the spectrum, you would see these uh, hints of the. It depends if they're of a perturbative or non-perturbative nature. In the Veneziano formula, it's computed in the perturbative string uh, machinery. Right. And you can see some hints because the, the, there's a tachyon in the spectrum. I think if there is a non-perturbative instability, you would have to look for a deep e to the minus. It may not be visible in the perturbative uh, regime, provided, assuming there exists a sitter vacua for parametrically small values of the string coupling. Mm -hmm. But it could be, on the other hand, that uh, to find a sitter vacuum, you need to study string theory for slightly small but non-vanishing values of the string coupling. And there, the machinery may, may require new tools. But it would be, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand, if you were to find the violation that you want to attribute to this metastability, you would need to know something about uh, tunneling the barrier out to the 10 dimensional Minkowski space. And I, I don't think general results are known about how high that barrier can be. So how could just, you know, unitarity and consistency tests tell you, oh, this is a violation. They would have to know how big this, I mean, let, let me just say, I can take the limit in which I, I make the barrier bigger and bigger. And I would say this unitarity violation should be smaller and smaller. How, how can I convince myself that there, there are some nonetheless. I, I don't know. I, I, I wonder how Unitarity would know about that, that parameter, the height of the barrier. So I, I think there's another concrete example that people studied a long time ago, which was called the C equal one uh, string theory model, where you had a metastate, essentially a metastable space, and you could calculate an S matrix in perturbation theory. And it looked perturbatively 
unitary, but they're, they're up to e to the minus one over g string corrections. Uh, and you might expect that uh, there are similar mm -hmm. things here. It, it's just a matter of, you know, how much control you have over the calculation. Um, it, it, the problem with, with the, the sitter is that we don't know whether it lives in this parametrically small string coupling regime. So you, it's very difficult to quantify the question, really. And I think uh, aligned with the Costa's point a little bit is, is that ADS-CFT is a framework that goes beyond uh, perturbative string theory. It permits uh, us to study ADS vacua for values of G string in principle in the M theory regime or elsewhere. So uh, that framework, you know, the general idea of ADS CFT and holography allows us to break loose a little bit from the perturbative uh, string regime. And so maybe that's another motivation. Since we're talking about unitarity and we mentioned uh, um, the bosonic string, uh, can someone review to what extent uh, the bosonic string theory that has tachyons uh, as unitary in, in perturbation theory or, or beyond? What, uh, wouldn't it be non-unitary if there are tachyons in the spectrum? I think it's pretty maybe good. Paolo is the most best suited to address this question. The residues of the poles being real and all of that. Um, actually, in the case of the Bosnian string, uh, I, I, uh, I don't know uh, really, really well. one, uh, one thing that one could expect is that when, when you start to look at the um, um, the the post when you do the, the when you do the expansion is not just necessary uh, that uh, things factorize properly, but uh, that the coefficients are positive. And I think it can happen that the coefficients of, of this pole are not positive. That's uh, one one way to check. I I, am an, I I don't know if anyone did it or not. It's probably known whether perturbative bosonic string. Uh, well, the the residues are positive, but then you have this uh, pole at negative mass. So then it comes from a unitary irrep. But there's still like there's still it's exchanging. Fairly, it's fairly mild, though. It, it's not that well, you find yeah. complex numbers. I mean, you can have a tachyonic theory which is unitary, right? Just just a standard model. You know, the Higgs mechanism. The mass is negative, but just says we're not in the right vacuum. Uh, you have a tachyon, which means the, the, the Higgs has to condense. Once the Higgs condenses, then uh, everything is, is, is manifestly unitary. So, okay, for a bosonic string theory, you know, if we roll down you know, to, to condense the tachyon and so on, for open string theory, of course, now is, this is now understood. So, but in general, it's, it's, it's a difficult question. I don't think uh, tachyons are necessarily linked to non-unitarity. But in perturbation theory, they would be. If I just look at perturbative string theory with the tachyon, would it be non-unitary? And I have to wait for the tachyon to condense before I see it uh, unitarity? Or how? I, if I just do, you know, some simple uh, scattering and require factorizations uh, in the effective theory with a tachyon, I would imagine. I don't think you see any issue with uh, with uh, probability. Uh, it's just that it's a non-unitary irrep. Well, non unitary, you say? Yeah, because it has negative mass. But there are unitary representation with negative masses in Poincare. I think that's fine. Okay, well, maybe that's a bit tangential. <laughs> Okay, let me um, no, let me try to switch gears again. I'm just uh, nobody is uh, mentioning anything, so I'll just I, I wanted to ask a, a question to Costas about this RG flow in the arrow of time. That's um, um, I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wrote in the chat, but I usually think of the RG flow as a, as a human concept, not like a 
nature uh, concept in the sense that I'm an experimentalist, I have resolution, then I see theory A, theory B, depending on my uh, resolution. Uh, well, here it seems to be playing a fundamental role describing the era of time and so on. So what do you think is like running the RG for you from this uh, boundary perspective? I think for me, okay, the, the theory is defining the UV and then once you, uh, if you have a relevant information, it's, it's going to start running and then it's going to go somewhere in the IR. Actually, maybe can, can I share just to show one slide? Um, go for it. Let me see. Um, Okay, so um, <clears throat> so here we define the theory in the UV. If you know the theory in the UV, you know it for all for all energies in the IR. So that maps on this side. Okay, so here is our universe. I mean, it, it does change the philosophy about what it means to you know how the physical laws work. So usually in gravity, we say, okay, let's give some initial conditions here, and this is gonna tell us how the future is going to work. But here in this philosophy, in this holographic philosophy, if you're here, this is corresponds to be some energy scale there. And then this means, you know, everything to the past. So you're able to explain in a sense, all observations you see from the past, but in general, unless somebody comes and tell you what is the UV theory, what is the theory of everything, you can only have constrained knowledge about what you can say about the future because it's like going inverse in the RG flow. So for me, it's not just, uh, let's say, um, we call them field theories do come equipped with uh, kind of the stratify with energy. They, you know, the, the quantum field theory behaves in different ways in different energies. And then uh, this different behavior is what is perceived, what we perceive as time evolution in, in, over there. Another confusion that I have is that typically you'd think that there are more degrees of freedom in the UV versus the IR, while we think that the that's, universe is hotter, things are more active. Uh, I would say that's a, that's a feature, right? In a sense, we, we think, you know, when people ask, you know, why is it an hour of time? And then people say it's because this, uh, it's, it's a tropic, it's more entropy, there are more degrees of freedom. In the future, here you see it exactly why it happens. UV has more degrees of freedom than the IR, and then some people say, then you know, if that's the case, then the universe must have started in a very entropic state because the state we are now, it has you know far fewer entropy than it could have had if all matter was was inside black holes. Now, from this perspective, and then they say why? So if if you look at the 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 space of all possible initial conditions. What is the probability that we start from a very low entropic state? So here is again, it's the universality of quantum field theory that tells you that there's, there's nothing really to choose. Everything is universal. You start from a very simple uh, initial state. So the, the IR state is, is extremely simple. And it's just the universality that, that tells you uh, that the initial state was a low entropic. So I would say these are both, uh, the, 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 this, these are bonus rather than problems. This explain these conceptual issues. This, this, this go together with this qualitative, what I call in, in, in my initial slides, kind of qualitative evidence for the existence of a holographic description of this type. Maybe to connect this uh, to the questions of unitarity, if we don't, uh, require the standard uh, positivity conditions in the QFT, one could imagine having cyclic RG flows. Have you considered this possibility in your picture? No, I mean, that's true. You, you, you could have. Um, but at the same time, in a sense, the, uh, the, the mapping suggests that even if the theory is not unitary, it should, of, of course, there are non-unitary theories that do have a monotonic flow. It's not that not all non-unitary, there are also non-unitary theories that have uh, cycles. 
So this picture suggests that whatever theory we use over here should be of the type that uh, has a monotonic flow. Unless it's a bouncing uh, one of these. Uh... <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, why can't, yeah, yeah, maybe. I guess it could, it, it <laughs> it could, could be yeah, that, in a sense, the cyclic universes could fit into this, this pattern by having uh, dual quantum field theory that has limit cycle, has uh, RG cycles. So, yeah. Okay, so I have to go. Uh, unfortunately, I'm handing the reins to Costas to continue moderating. And, uh, just thanks a lot for everyone for participating for the chat. And uh, Gee, I think you had another question for me in the, in the chat before you go. So, yes, I was about this. Uh, about this. Uh, yeah, I, maybe I will just listen, but I won't be moderating. Um, it was about this lattice QCD. I was curious to see if you could uh, somehow uh, find the spectrum of the theory and check that they're consistent with uh, the Cedar unitary EREPs. Now, I mean, that's a much harder computation within the lattice uh, computation. Actually, the lattice theory we simulate is not the CFT. This is one of the perturbative models. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's five to the fourth theory in three dimensions. Uh, so the, the, you know, what you can see is when, what happens in the IR is, is there a master I mean, usually, let's say the theories we take for granted that we consider massless theories, but this is a highly non-trivial question. It's, um, so naively, you can, uh, you, you can think that you can push the, the, mass, the mass to zero, but even perturbatively, you can see that uh, there are tadpoles that have to, to, uh, to, to be equal to zero. And non-perturbatively, if you try to, to calculate what bare mass you put into uh, your theory so that the theory is, 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 is massless in the continuum limit, then you find that uh, it's not computable in perturbation theory because the, the, the diagrams are infrared divergent. So what we did in, on the lattice is we, we computed non-perturbatively the bare mass that you need to add to your initial, initial action so that uh, the theory is, uh, is massless in the continuum limit. And then we checked that uh, everything is, is, is infrared finite. Yeah. But I mean, the, to go to the detail to understand uh, the, so the structure of the theory in the IR, it's, 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 it's not within the uh, current uh, capabilities. So. I see, pretty cool. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks everyone, see you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, any more questions? Maybe from people that haven't talked so far. Um, I think the questions in the chat, we pretty much addressed all of them. So the questions can also be about stuff we haven't discussed, but it is on kind of the general theme of this afternoon. It would be nice if we do have a discussion. So, you know, just uh, uh, unmute yourself and talk. You don't even have to put your hand up. Yeah, everybody is very quiet. Hey, uh, so can I ask you further a bit about this uh, IR? Um, yes, of course. Fixed point uh, RG analogy uh, thing. So you were saying that the IR state is kind of fixed. Uh, because that's where you flow from the UE. Uh, yes. Was that the picture? It's universal. It's universal. Just the universality of usual. Uh, yeah, but this this assumes that you like it's kind of like an equal picture if you want to think about the time flowing up because the IR fixed point will in general have lots of irrelevant directions and you could have like different places in the UE where you could flow to the same IR fixed point. Uh, 
yeah, so you could have different UVs that go to the same IR, and this would describe different universes, play times that had a similar kind of inflationary past. Uh, and there's nothing, uh, I don't see anything wrong with that. Actually, most uh, inflationary predictions are sort of universal. Um, Okay, so it, does this picture tell you that uh, like there's a huge sensitivity to how you tune your initial data for the? Yeah, I think I think it does. I think many of the results that came out of you know the last ten years, including some of the stuff that we've had in this conference, show that many of the inflationary predictions are really fixed by the underlying the of isometries of a few constants. So they're not very sensitive to uh, how exactly things happen. And I think uh, this is the sign of uh, this universality. And if, and if you look, uh, let's say, the uh, non Gaussianities, again, they're fixed up to a few constants from the underlying conformal structure. Yeah, I would say that's true for all non gaussianity that are very small and probably not detectable in the conceivable future, but the ones that are large necessarily break the sitter isometries and therefore are not fixed by the sitter isometry. So, I mean, there is one possibility in the sense everything that we would observe is completely fixed by symmetries, by this universality. And then uh, we don't have any window to uh, what was really the physics, the very early universe physics. That would be both good and bad. And this is good because, okay, we understand the physical principles that fix this, this quantities, but bad that, you know, we don't have a prop to this uh, kind of quantum gravity regime. And at least for, uh, for people that come from, you know, the high energy end, okay, the, the early universe, uh, has been viewed as an opportunity to get a new handle, an observable experimental observational handle into quantum gravity. And we may have this or, or may not. Like you know what I was saying in, the, in, in, in my brief discussion, okay, we now see that uh, this infrared finiteness and that could possibly have observational evidence. So that would go in a sense, uh, against this, uh, it would be a signal which is not fixed by symmetries, but it is unique to the theory that describes the very early universe. So I think both possibilities are open. Do any of the panelists have any remarks about the entropy, the proposed Entropy of the Decider horizon. I mean, that's an interesting question. I think it's an unpredictable question. It's definitely not uh, within our current uh, technology, but it's, it's definitely, uh, if we fully understand holography non perturbatively, okay, that uh, should explain the entropy or the meaning of the entropy. But you believe it has a role to play even from the full uh, global cosmological perspective. This is just a, a question really about an instinct based on uh, the lessons we've learned about horizons in general. And now there's a lot of work about the interior of the horizon as well, uh, like we saw in the Gabor talk. And uh, so it seems like a natural question in this context as well. Well, my own instinct is that it's not going to play a role when we compare with uh, observables, cosmological observables. There's more kind of um, a Gedanken experiment that might help us, but, but not when we compare with, um, with experiments. So of, of course, this is just a feeling that I might be wrong. Well, it would be nice to have an estimate of the mistake that perturbation theory which assumes an infinitely large Hilbert space is making, if the interpretation is correct that the Hilbert space is finite, then you know that all of these modes are not independent. And I haven't really seen, uh, for example, for high scale inflation, something like 10 to the 12, uh, um, uh, the value of the entropy, because now we are pre pretty, pretty high scale, so we can make uh, M Planck over H not huge. 
Um, but I don't know how to transform that into an estimate of how wrong our perturbation theory calculations are. I would like to, if people know what the correct scaling should be, that would be very useful. Uh, definitely we'll have the features that as, as we don't see tensor modes and the, and the energy scale of inflation goes down, the, uh, the entropy becomes larger. And so the, the fact that the number of degrees of freedom is finite becomes less and less of a mistake because it's finite, but it's very large. Uh, so, so, so as we don't measure tensors, we kind of, it's gonna be harder and harder to see the signal, but I don't know what scaling to expect. It would be very nice for me to, to hear if, if people, I mean, very, yeah, I don't know. very confusingly then from black holes, you say that non perturbability effects can lead to order one violations of unitarity. So maybe there are some observables in which this is not small, and it's not a two point function. I, I really don't know what to expect. Yeah, so a bit in connection to Dio's question, but also just like wandering off. Uh, have people um, looked a bit at uh, Lenny Saskin's recent papers? Uh, Not, yeah. not in enough detail to have any anything useful to say. It also, but they they also uh, emphasize a little bit the question of the interior of the the city horizon. Yeah, exactly. And there's like in the latest one, there's actually something concrete put forward for uh, uh, if you assume that there's some holographic model living on uh, on the stretched horizon, then. Uh, what kind of properties uh, time evolution uh, has to have. So there's an exponential expansion in the interior that actually in like a finite thermal time set by the interior has to like kind of completely decouple the two horizons for correlators between the two horizons. And this is very special behavior. So you can look for it and he uh, proposes a certain limit of the SYK model where uh, you could look uh, uh, well, why would the holographic theory live in a stretch horizon rather than at uh, a sky plus future infinity? I mean, why would it live at sky plus and not at the stretch horizon? <laughs> oh, it's sky plus. Okay, then you get, in a sense, everything I, I, I described. This this gives this is a good uh, Cauchy surface. Uh, you can set up uh, the, the dictionary I described and then correctly reproduces inflationary predictions. Um, yeah, I guess the the ad advantage of uh, having a stretched horizon is that it's a time-like surface, uh, which is where we uh, typically can put quantum systems. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with quantum systems and space-like surfaces. I mean, what, 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 statistical models, I mean, I don't understand the, 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 that, that criticism. Okay, actually, there were a few other slides by other people. Why, why people think Euclidean quantum field theory has any subtleties? I mean, there isn't, but also like where you put the, hol uh, the holographic screen, uh, is it like a unique choice? I mean, even in ADS, you can kind of move it around, change conformal frame, uh, introduce PT bar deformations and so on. Uh, so, so I well, guess the question conformal frame, is, yeah. that's because it's a CFT. So any, uh, it's really a conformal class that, that matters. I think for the other, I don't think it's quantitatively understood how to really move it anywhere else, but the conformal boundary. It's, there are lots of ideas through the years. I think there's, a, if I can add to, to this discussion, there's a curiosity which comes in the Euclidean signature of the sitter, which is that uh, both the global universe and the static patch universe analytically continue to the Euclidean sphere in Euclidean signature. And this is a peculiar mathematical fact whose physics I don't understand, but it seems to package both future boundary uh, calculations and horizon calculations in the same space in Euclidean signature. I, I don't know what it means though. But your sphere is the whole geometry, not some boundary. 
What do you mean by that? Well, I think the thing that they're that Gabor and Costas are arguing about is whether or not you can anchor your theory somewhere, which is usually co-dimension one. But your uh, well, the co-dimension is, is, is a little is a little tricky. I, all I'm saying, I, I'm just saying, if I, just some property of Euclidean signature. It could be that uh, there are multiple ways to do the calculation in the Lorentzian signature uh, that are secretly uh, the same. Uh, that's all I'm saying. Yeah. It's a curious thing that ADS in Euclidean signature still has a boundary, whereas uh, the sitter in Euclidean signature somehow does not. I don't know what this means. Yeah. By the way, I'll have to argue with Costas a bit on this conformal frame statement because if you put a CFT in flat space, it's conformal to a sphere. And in the ADS dual, uh, in one case, you have the Poincare patch, in the other case, you have global ADS. And the difference is that in global ADS, you have a constant radius cutoff surface that on the Poincare patch turns into a cutoff surface that hits the horizons. And uh, they just differ by point, point, right? They just differ by three. point. They just, the, the boundary, in one case is R crosses three, in the other case is the plane. They just differ by one point, and then the physics just differs on the boundary conditions you impose on that point. If it is the same as the boundary conditions you impose on the sphere, it's going to be no yeah, different. Yeah, but this is what I'm the saying. Field. So the, the, the physics is the same, but the holographic screen is different. So in one case, you have a holographic screen that is the cylinder. In the other case, it's part of the cylinder, and, and it hits the cylinder uh, at the horizons of the Poincaré patch. So it's like non-uniform, like in one coordinates you have a, or let's say in global ADS coordinates, uh, when you put the CFT on a sphere, you have a uniform cutoff. When you put it on the Poincaré patch, you have a non-uniform cutoff. Yeah, maybe we should discuss this off, uh, uh, offline. Um, I mean, it's, it's really the only difference is really the boundary conditions. If you use the same boundary conditions, it's- Yeah, it's, but I think the point I just wanted to make is that the physics is the same, that, but the holographic screen is at a different location. And why is it a problem? So it's, uh, you could have uh, described the same- For me, it's always the conformal boundary. The conformal boundary doesn't change by changing coordinates. It, it, you know, you, it, you may think it looks differently, but it, it, it's, a top, it's not a metric concept, the, 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 the conformal boundary. Yeah, I, I agree, I agree. But on the other hand, we never talk about ADS without an explicit large, large cutoff. Uh, and it, it's needed to regulate quantities like entanglement entropy or... Uh, but I mean, that should really be... I mean, that, that should really be the, the cutoff. Uh, that's if you use Feynman Graham coordinates, then the boundary is, the entire boundary is by definition at z equal to zero. In other coordinates, some of that may look as if there are points in the interior, like, you know, the, the, the point in, in Poincaré coordinates, there is this one point, which is the intersection of the, um, the, 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 the horizon with the boundary, which, which can conformally compactifies. It might look like you do something in the, the deep interior, but at the end of the day, it's really cut off. That has to cut off all points of the true boundary. Um, and then you can uh, okay, move around, you know, do the ephemophysics, change the cutoff and so on. But these are not gonna change the, uh, the observables and the physics of the problem. Yeah, I agree. I think we hit the two hour point now. Uh, are there any last minute questions? Anything we haven't discussed so far?
Okay. Then I suppose we should close the session. Well, thanks for coming and for listening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. You.